bird song, bird song, and you have to mimic it. And then the the uh, computer program measures your mimicking with the birds, compares it, and then tells you the percentages. And it's uh, kind of it opens up your mind to how complex bird songs are, especially some of them. So this is again an uh, this is an installation in Scusa, which I will explain in a minute. And this is uh, this mechanism that I designed for flying. And these bird, uh, these wings were with uh, sensors, so it's a, in the largest virtual reality space in the world. And that's everybody in the space listening to bird song. Light. And so now I'll show you the videos. So. Let's raise the This is the blue mark that I described earlier. So that's all the places that was shown. That's Jim Jeffsky, he's setting up. strange quantum field. And this is the Hub Zodiac earlier versions. So you can see how long we've been at it. It's only now kind of really... This was the first version and then in uh, Hong Kong. brainstorming that I mentioned with Mark Cohen. I'm really happy we just got funding to continue this work. We started using these aluminum hats <laughs> because they use them in neuroscience labs. And this is a Professor Constant uh, Hammond in Marseille at the Lumini. And here at UC San Diego. 
What do the hats do for you? <laughs> they protect you from waves. <laughs> but not cosmic rays. No. It's kind of like a fun thing. So that's the octopus mandala that was at the Pacific Pier. It was amazing to program that wheel. Really fun. We got a lot of press for that one. <laughs> Sydney, New York, all Ferris wheels. This is the original version, and then I'll show you the video of the last one that I did. Yeah. This was done uh, at the University of Scupa in the largest VR space, and it's a four-minute video, but it's going to give you a really good idea of, of what was achieved here. So, um, the, all of this is looked at from the outside, so you have to imagine everybody was in the space looking at it in 3D, so all the images, the birds, everything was 3D. And when you enter into the space, you, you start by looking at what birds find interesting. And everything, all the bird sounds were actually Japanese bird sounds that uh, Dr. Reiji Suzuki gave to us. I wanted them to first get like this idea of worms and different things that birds would be interested in. And this is the... Um, a device that Professor Hiro Iwata designed where you could actually fly within the space and you could have up to 12 people in the space sharing this virtual reality. So here we have the bird sounds, bird sounds and then you get flocking and the flocking is uh, programmed by the physicist Takashi Bidani's group and the swarms actually learn behavior as people move to it. So these are the wings, 
and the buttons you can see have these sensors. So as people move, they influence the space around them and the birds around them. What was interesting is to see how people self-organize to affect some kind of change. That's the physicist, Hiroshi Kiyami. He's quite famous in Japan. And he really enjoyed doing this because a lot of his programming ends up in the computer. He suddenly had it in this huge VR space with people creating these spontaneous circles to affect them in a certain way. And uh, he was starting to analyze human behavior in relation to the bird movement. Now the second part is how birds see us. In other words, well, what is the perspective they see? So I grabbed a, a lot of videos from YouTube of these kind of collective, uh, and then also started thinking about mechanical birds or drones. This is the uh, mimic machine, which we're going to do in two days on Saturday here in uh, Del Rey Lagoon, which is on the way to LAX uh, as part of the LA Currents uh, Art Biennial that you're all invited to. Um, quite fun and wonderful. And, uh, this is just a 10 second preview so you can get an idea. Listen so, closely to this bird song. Storm Peter L. <laughs> now mimic the bird song after the bee. Now it's measuring. Analyzing results, please wait. Your accuracy is. 11 percent. Don't worry, please try again. <laughs> All right, so that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to show you tonight. And again, uh, part of the Allied Biennial, we're doing the birdsong mimic in the Del Rey Lagoon. Uh, and it's uh, dealing with the environment and the drought in particular, and trying to point to people that listening to birds, we can actually tell that there's a, there's a problem with both migration and lack of water in particular. Um, and it's also fun, so you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Or? Well, I'm gonna take my privilege as host to, to take the first question okay. and say how inspired I am it's a birdsong diamond work, and um, Thank you. yeah, um, 
and looking at it reminded me that 1973, when I was just a boy, I tape recorded the sounds of birds at my grandma's house in Illinois. She lives in a, a place that's renowned for its canopy of elm trees. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they're mostly gone now from Dutch elm disease. But it was such a beautiful place, and it was home, it made me happy. And I got this recording of the birds then, and I, you know, interpreting them and synthesizing oh, the, really? the emotions that you know that those sounds produced. I think could help to make a hostile place feel like home. For example, the Mojave Desert that I and Gene live in, or Mars, <laughs> like John is um, recreating, <laughs> or pre-creating, rather. <laughs> so um, I, I found great meaning in your work. So any other questions, please? Sort of a, more of a comment. Uh, this the project that uh, Mark Cohen did in 1986 about the inverted vision. I know they've been doing that since the 1950s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. And when I was in elementary school, probably around 1965, 66, there was a black and white education film by the Moody Institute at O D Y, of which they documented that. My psychology text. That's right. About that. That's right. So it's been going around for a good 50 or 60 years. Yes. I just didn't hear about the second phase where you know, after, long after people had recovered, you put it back in and they snapped in again. The second phase I've never right. heard of before. He did tell me about the Moody experiments and the mm -hmm. predecessor to that. Mm -hmm. Are you coordinating any research between the dolphins and whales and their sounds and the bird sounds? No, it's interesting you're saying that. I actually am not. I'm familiar with it. I'm very interested. But what I am starting is work with um, a chemist from Vienna, Alfred Wendel, who does these incredible visualizations. And right now he's visualizing from data, 3D data that he then animates, uh, these organisms that are kind of primary <coughs> organisms, plankton, um, just base, like zebrafish level, really primary. Um, in, so in water. And what I'm interested in is underwater pollution, and meaning the sound, underwater sound pollution, and the impact it has on, on these creatures. And to look at it from the primary level, rather than approaching the dolphin, which seems like such a complex being and so out of reach for me, certainly. Um, I'm very excited about that new project we're doing. So we're just starting, and I'm uh, actually making contact with some marine biologists who are specializing. I didn't know. I actually was shocked to, f no, happily shocked to find out that there's a lot of research in this area. But apparently, the noise underwater is out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. Um, there's, we don't see it, we don't feel it. So who cares? But actually, it's um, over a thousand times more of what we could handle. And it's probably pretty devastating. A lot of people are paying attention to pollution and sense of dirt and all the chemicals, etc. But somehow, sound and noise doesn't seem to be uh, a problem for most of the public, anyway. So I'm starting work on that. Definitely. And I'm fascinated with dolphins, of course, who is it's incredible. The level of intelligence and the communication. And, and of course, noise must be affecting them horribly because their whole community depends on their sounds and sound waves and how they talk to each other. So it must be really interrupted and pretty devastating, actually. How many people work with you? It depends on the project. Uh, for the Birdsong Diamond, it's been the most ever. Um, I Usually I feel like I'm a band leader and there's four to eight people and I'm kind of... I actually at one point I dropped out of art school and I, was, I had a band. <laughs> so I, I think I learned to collaborate and work in groups like that. 
But this project, I felt more like an orchestra conductor because I think there's about 50 people involved. And for some reason, the kind of artist vision holds it together. So it's quite a task to keep everybody in sync and interested and really amazing to do. But um, that's it's project dependent, really. And that project is large primarily because Chuck Taylor started off by inviting people from so many different disciplines to look at it. And then I came in and I added my whole group. So you have Chuck Taylor's group, you have my group, you have Takashi Nigari's group, and then Hiro Ivata with his engineering. So you, if you add all the groups and then you add to that all the different students and different people interested, it's quite large as a collaboration. But sometimes it's like three people. It really depends on the project. I'm curious about the um, butterfly metamorphosis project mm -hmm. you described. So you said when you got the audio yeah. file, it's a sped up version yeah. of, from reality. So by sped up by what factor? How much faster was it on the recording versus what the actual I metaphor think was? eight times. Only eight? Yeah, it's, it wasn't too much. Okay. And then you, you, uh, how many distinct uh, bursts were there over the course of the entire metamorphosis? I never counted. Yeah. Okay. I never counted. I, I mean, it was a period of two weeks. Two weeks. That's really how long it takes. Hmm the whole process, um, but that's, are you a scientist? No, I'm just curious. That's a very scientist question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I was fascinated actually, it's, funnily enough, you're saying that yesterday we were looking at the zebra fish going from egg to becoming fish is in 24 hours. It's mind blowing actually watching it. So it's exactly the same kind of bursts over the course of its... A little bit. But not the same, and you can't really measure it okay. in bursts because it's in water, so it's impossible to measure it. I mean, mm -hmm. is that growth and change unique to these butterflies? This this mm -hmm. bursting as it evolves, or I don't think so. But it was, uh, I'm sure that that happens in nature a lot, mm -hmm. and and I think it's uh, it must be different depending on the species, of course, but. Uh, What's fascinating about it is the fact that it's so dramatic and so constant, mm -hmm. and not like a little here, a lot there. Um, I found that pretty amazing, actually. What's your favorite thing about doing these kinds of projects? Learning. <laughs> yeah, just kind of discovering new stuff. and. And also not knowing where I'm going to end up with it. So when Chuck, Chuck Taylor is a good example, and the Butterfly Project is another one, it can, it's almost like the project wants to happen more than I want to make the project happen. Does that make sense? So if somebody, if, when Chuck comes and he says, I want to do something with birds, when that started, I was like, Words. But the fact that it opened up into this incredible world, and I've learned so much, and it changed my senses, it changed my relationship to the environment, and my sense of the whole network of birds and where they are and when you don't hear them, and to learn to listen, and how much I've learned from different angles, how the engineers approach it, how the linguists approach it. The Audubon Society, this whole world opened up to me just from saying, okay, let's do this, with no way of knowing where it's going to take me. So it's not like there's a project proposal and I know where it's going to go. I love that because I feel like, okay, let's see where it goes. Um, and I, as an example, just before the fire a month and a half ago around Topanga, where I live, there was an amazing moment where it was absolute silence. And I just knew something was 